Chapter 10, beginning with verse 13, we hear at Calvary Chapel, one of our distinctives is to teach verse by verse through a book in the Bible so that you might know that book by its author, its context, the purpose of it being written, and just to take it verse by verse, section by section, and try to apply it uh, to our culture, to our lives today. And it says in verse 13, they brought little children, and that term little children is actually a term that means babies are one to three year olds. It's kind of the toddler section of life. They brought little children to him that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said, let the children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white. In fact, Jesus had a t-shirt on that said, children matter in my sight. I don't know if you realize that. <laughs> no, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. That's a song that was penned in 1895. And throughout ancient history, the value of children has been very mixed and very different. You know the story of Herod when Jesus was born and the wise men showed up. He, he went to Bethlehem and all the male children two years and under were put to death. Not a lot of value seen by Herod and children. The pharaohs of Egypt during the time of Moses drowned all the male children that were being born at the time that he felt like the, the Israelites, the Jews were populating at too fast of a pace, and so he felt they were a threat to his safety, to his kingdom, and so he had them drowned in the Nile River. The Romans, uh, during Jesus' time, had trash heaps where unwanted children could be placed. If you didn't want a child, you took it there, and, and they could be left there to die, or they could be taken and raised as slaves or prostitutes or gladiators. And I'm not so sure that kids are that safe in the U.S. today. There's the trafficking, there's sex abuse, there's abortion. You know, I was, I was reading some statistics about abortions, how they've dropped since the 80s or 90s, but the reason they have is because they've come out with all these different medicines and pills that, that people can take now uh, that, that create abortions instead of going to the clinics. And the statistics are pretty staggering in America, there's mothers who abuse drugs and alcohol before their kids are born. There's neglect. So children, let them come to me, Jesus says. I love them. Now, of course, there's the opposite issue where children are turned into idols. You guys know any idol children? <laughs> Constantly pampered and coddled, made the center of the universe, and they gladly occupy that place if you let them. They'll sit upon their high chairs and give orders and directives. <laughs> their personal thrones, as I call them. They have mountains of toys and pleasures at their fingertips. But Jesus loves children. They're a gift, they're a blessing, a creation of God, and there's a balance to, to maintain with them in your life. Jesus says they're a picture for us. L listen to what he says again. Let the children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them in his arms and he laid his hands on them and he blessed them. He says they're, they're, they're a picture, if you will, an example of how someone enters the kingdom of God, heaven. And children are, are amazing. I, I, I helped raise three kids with my wife, and now we have a host of, of grandkids. And 
they're interesting to observe and, and to be a part of their lives. And, and one thing, children have the amazing ability to trust. They don't have a choice, I don't guess, but they have this amazing ability to, to trust you. Hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to take you inside and we're going to get, the, okay, just pick, pick me up. They're very totally dependent on adults. And they have to receive everything because they don't earn or, or really create anything. So they're dependent. They're trusting. They have to receive. And it's interesting to me, we spend our whole life trying to be independent, self-sufficient, told not to trust people or the system. People are always telling us as we're young, grow up, would you grow up? And Jesus says, no, be like a child. The kingdom of God is received, not earned. You receive salvation, life eternal, through trust, through belief, through depending on what he did. By grace are you saved through faith, not by works, not through baptism, not through confirmation, not through a baby dedication, not through church attendance, not through good works. You, I, receive salvation through trust and dependence like a child. And they're totally dependent on us. You know, growing up in, in our house, our three kids, I, I never remember Neil or Ryan or Jenny saying, Dad, are you going to pay the electric bill this month? <laughs> they never asked me that. They just assumed I would. They, they were totally dependent. I never heard him ask Lynn, hey, Mom, is there going to be any food in the refrigerator or pantry? They just assumed it would be there. Totally dependent on us. They, they never said, hey, are we going to have any clothes to wear next week? Children are content to live off you. They're all freeloaders. I know you know that, right? <laughs> They're super happy to live that way. They live by faith. That's what children do. They believe there'll be heat. They believe there'll be air conditioning. They, they don't even think about you paying for car insurance or, or gas or tires. Just drive me to Sweet Frog. That's what they say. I don't care how we get there. Just take me. <laughs> they live by faith. They trust. They depend. They hope. They have great expectancy. They're pretty much as young children, toddlers, babies, pretty much worry-free. They go to the bathroom in their diaper. <laughs> they just assume someone will take it off. <laughs> someone will wipe me clean. If they don't, I don't care. <laughs> That's what I found out about little kids. They could care less. Woo, they walk by and go, woo. <laughs> you can going to send a two or three-year-old to get dressed if they, if they will do it. And they don't worry about matching. They don't care about their hair, what it looks like. I don't care. If it's a stormy night, I can remember thunderstorms and lightning, and you could hear the kids coming down the hall. They're, they're coming to your room. For some reason, they think your bedroom is lightning-proof or storm-proof. <laughs> and we grow up. And we kind of lose that childlike faith, that, that dependency. We wonder, is God going to provide? Will, will the Father in heaven take care of me? Is he going to be there? Is he mad at me? And we, we forget that, that Jesus says, hey, you trust and depend and, and, and count on you know, the Lord just like a child does. Scripture says in 1 Peter, you know, cast all your cares upon him because he does care for you. I think sometimes we forget that. You know, when it's lightning and thundering and there's a storm in your life or my life, it's, it's, it's like a child, run, run to the Father. Amen. He cares. Simply trust him and depend on him and, and constantly over and over again uh, receive his grace and love and, and, and stuff that we could never deserve. We don't earn it. 
So, so Jesus kind of sets this uh, standard, if you will, here in chapter 10. And he says, you know, for such is the kingdom. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child, you, you, you can't enter it. You got to be dependent. You got to be trusting. You, you're not worthy of it. And then there's this contrast that is set here in this passage. In verse 17, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him. Good teacher, or we could translate that rabbi. What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, why, why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That's God. You know the commandments. No adultery, no murder, no stealing, no lying or bearing false witness. Don't defraud or honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said, teacher or master, all, all these things I've kept from, from my youth. And Jesus looking at him, and, and this is an interesting phrase here. Jesus looking at him, it says in verse 21, loved him and said to him, well, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. And come, take up your cross and follow me. And he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. This, this same story is told in Matthew and Mark and Luke. And in Luke it says that he was a ruler, someone with authority and power, a leader. It also says that, that he was, in, in Luke chapter 18, that he was very rich. And, and, and in one of the other gospels, I believe it's Matthew, says that he's young. So we've often heard this called the, the rich young ruler. He had youth, he had wealth, he had authority, he had power. I would submit to you he had the American dream. He had it all. He's young, he's rich, he's powerful, he's a leader. You know, I, I think as you talk to people today, the American dream is, well, you know, I want to be rich, I want to retire when I'm 35, I want to own my own company. And here he is. He's got it. He's rich, he's young, he's got power, and he also has character. He also has integrity, he also has morality, he also has humility. You don't see that in a lot of rich young rulers in America, but you see it in this guy. He kneels before Jesus, he, 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 he's, he's humble. You don't see that in a lot of rich people. He, he's humble. He kneels before Jesus, and, and he, he, here he is, this rich, young executive, but very humble. He seems to have it all, but he must have been watching and listening to Jesus, and he realized even though he's young and even though he's influential, something's missing in his life. And I think we have this story in the Bible because so many people think, if I could win the lotto, or if I was rich, or if I had authority, I'd be happy, I'd be satisfied, I'd be fulfilled. And here comes a man kneeling before Jesus, says, something's missing. I don't, I'm not sure I, I have entrance into the kingdom of God. I've got everything else. I've got the job. I've got the car. Maybe I've got the wife. I've got the man, the husband. But he comes and he falls before Jesus. Now listen, he's not a leper. We've seen that guy fall before Jesus. Said, if, if you will, you can make me clean. This is not a leper. This is not a woman with an issue of blood trying to just, if I could just touch him, I'm unclean. This is not a paralytic tearing the roof off like we've seen in Mark, you know, just begging his friends that Jesus would heal. His need, his, his desire has to do with the question of eternity. Not heal my body, but something inside's going on with this individual. And Jesus responds to this. He looked at him, and, and he loved him. 
And it seems like he had done all he knew to do through the law, through religion, through Judaism. He tells him, I've kept, I've kept those, those laws, I've kept those rules. But so, something is, is missing in my life. I, I don't think it, he realized it wasn't more money, it wasn't more power, it wasn't more youth. It wasn't more religion. And so he asked the question, what, what, what can I do? And he's still in this mindset of how can I earn it? How, how can I work for it? What, what can I do? He's obviously a high achiever. He knows how to get the job done. So, okay, Jesus, you just tell me what to do. I'll get it done. What more stuff, good deeds, can, can I do to make eternal life mine? Jesus says, well, look at Jesus' response. It's interesting to me. He says, uh, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that's God. There was a saying in that day, in that time, that culture, only God is good. So either he observed and felt like Jesus was God in the flesh, or he's trying to schmooze Jesus. You're like God. Jesus says, you know the law. You, you, you want to get life eternal, then, 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 then do those things that the law commands. Adultery, don't do that. Don't, don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Don't defraud. Honor your father and mother. Matthew adds, what do I lack? I've done it all, he says. If, if that gave me this life, Jesus, I wouldn't be here. Then he says, okay, then if you've done all that, and perhaps he had, perhaps he's a very moral individual, a very strong integrity in this man's life, a hard worker. He says, oh, then there's one more thing you can do. He says, one thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have, give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Come take up the cross and follow me. Okay, one more thing, Jesus says. Get rid of your stuff. But he went away sad. It doesn't say he went away mad or thinking Jesus was a weirdo or, or what a jerk that Jesus is. He wants me to give my stuff away. That's not the case. He, he went away sad, I believe, because his heart was revealed. He loved his money more than he loved God. Jesus says, not your character, you, you, you're, you're moral, you, you've got a good lifestyle, you've got integrity towards others. But, but there's another priority in your life that Jesus puts his finger on that's greater than your love for God. Let go of it, he says, and follow me. Now please listen, Jesus is not saying, give all your money away and you'll be spiritual. Abraham was wealthy, very, very wealthy. In fact, in, in Genesis chapter 13, it says that he was very rich. Abraham was in livestock and silver and gold, so much so that it was a burden to him. Wouldn't you like to have that burden? I got so much gold and livestock and silver, it's just a burden. I mean... You look at the life of Abraham. He had all the silver, all the gold, all the livestock, and he never, ever settled down. He lived in a tent. Abraham could have stopped anywhere along the way and built a mansion. Been very satisfied in that type of life. But he, he, he lived in a tent, and everywhere he went, he built an altar to the Lord. The tent symbolized his relationship with the world that he was passing through. And the altar symbolized his relationship with the next world and with his God. And even though he was wealthy, wealth did not own Abraham. He knew it was all temporary. Joseph, second in command in the most powerful nation of his time. Only one greater than him was Pharaoh. 
David was very wealthy. Jesus is not saying that, that being wealthy is wrong. But, but this man in, in, in our story can't let go of the temporary for the eternal. Jesus said two things to him. Go and come. Go, go sell and come follow. And I would submit to you that that's a lot of what life is about with the Lord. Go and come. Go and sell. That, that was specific to this individual. Come follow me. Well, that's for everyone who desires eternal life. Money's not the issue for everyone. I, I can assure you it's, it's certainly not been the issue in my life. I don't have a lot of gold and silver that is such a burden to me. I don't know what to do. And when Lynn, when Lynn and I met, uh, we were both just out of college. I was driving one of my mom's old beater cars. I pulled over one time. She, she didn't know me that well. She was visiting here, and I pulled over one time because the tire was going flat, and I pulled up to this place off of the interstate that sold used tires, and I bought a used tire. Lynn goes, what are you doing? I go, I'm, I'm getting a tire. She goes, why are you stopping here? We might get robbed or something. I go, no, no, I know this guy. She goes, how do you know this guy? <laughs> I said, I've lived here all my life. She says, you're buying a used tire? I go, yeah. She said, now looking back, she goes, I should have run right then. That's what I should have <laughs> run right then. We, we lived in our first place, married a duplex in Greenbrier, and then be, be after that, it was behind the Gulf Breeze Stadium where we lived in a duplex. We moved to Kansas City, and we lived in a student apartment in Kansas City. It was a little tiny apartment where Lynn was going to college. I, I drove to seminary in our one car, and the refrigerator in our apartment, it was a really small apartment, had a freezer about this big. You could have ice cream or you could have ice. You had to choose. But the lucky thing in Kansas City, it's so cold in the winter, you could put the ice cream out in front of your front door if one of the other students didn't steal it at a Christian school. <laughs> I remember a big date for Lynn and I when we were dating, uh, I really actually after we were married, living in Kansas City, trying to me go to seminary, working jobs, and her working in a bank, and you know trying to make ends meet and get through school. The big date was for us to go to Shoney's Big Boy is that, is that still okay, Shoney? Has, has that been cut out because it's a racial situation? I don't know. Was he a, is he an okay guy, Shoney? I don't know. I can't keep up with all that. But anyway, it was splitting a big boy hamburger. That was like a big date. Like, wow, this is awesome. We always tithe. We made that a priority in our life. So Jesus asked this guy this question, basically, what is it that is more important to you that keeps you from following me? He realized for this man, it wasn't his character, it wasn't the things he was doing that were wrong, it was the fact that money had such a hold on him that he could not let go of it and come follow Jesus. Even though he recognized that Jesus was good, he recognized that Jesus had the answer for eternal life. So, so I think we all have to stop every once in a while. What is it that, that I place such high priority? Is it money? Is it sex? Is it drugs? I remember when, when I first started encountering the Lord, he, he said, John, you, you got to go and you got to leave those things in your life that come between you and me. Put away the drugs, the lying, the immoral lifestyle. Leave the old life. Go, leave the old life, and come, follow me. Now, I would submit to you that God is still dealing with things in my life. There's still a lot of go and leave and come and follow in every believer's life, right? You're still maturing. You're still changing. You're still growing. But there's also a go and come for those who have never experienced eternal life, to leave those things behind. 
You, you want eternal life? Be, become like a child. Be, be dependent and trust in what Jesus has done on the cross and receive forgiveness and salvation. If there's something keeping you from coming, he says, go and leave it behind. So he tells it very clearly to this individual. And it says he went away sad. Went away sad. Wait a minute, what? He had great possessions. I thought great possessions make you happy. What's he doing going away sad? He's got youth. He's got power. He's got authority. He, he's got money. And yet he's grieved. Isn't stuff and money that gives you real life? I mean, that's the American drumbeat, right? Boy, if we could get rich, and oh, there goes my communion. <laughs> I want to lose that. You know, I, I thought, boy, if you had stuff and money, that you would be happy. Jesus looked around in verse 23 and said to the disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And disciples were astonished. But Jesus answered again. He kind of clarifies it. Not, not just who have riches. How hard it is for those who trust, Jesus says, in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier, he says, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, well, who, who then can be saved? See, that their theology had been shaped and fashioned by, by, by the Old Testament and by, by, by God's commands and God's blessings if you keep my commands, if you keep my statues, my ways, I'll bless your herds, your families, your crops, your vineyards. And, and, and it, was, it was interesting the Jews kind of focused on that and they developed a mindset that rich means God's pleased with you. Poor, you're under punishment or correction. But it's not the whole truth. And Jesus says it's not about wealth. It's not about possessions. It's about becoming like a child, he says. It's about trusting. It's about dependence. It's about receiving. It's about belief. So, so the rich man says, what can I do? Jesus says, leave behind what you trust in. And he goes away sad. And Jesus says, it's hard for those who trust in their riches to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And some people have said, well, there was this gate, below a gate, and it was a camel. It could barely get through. It had to take all this. That, that's not a true story. The word for needle here in two of the Gospels is a sewing needle. And the point that Jesus is making is not that it's hard. It's impossible. For someone who trusts in something else other than and depended upon the grace and the cross of Jesus Christ to get into heaven. You can't save yourself. There's nothing you can do. With men, he says, it's impossible. But with God, he says, all things are possible. Amen. It's impossible to set yourself free. It's impossible to have eternal life by doing good works. It is possible to be rich and miserable. It is possible with God to, to find a new life and be free and forgiven. It, it is possible to have heaven as a destination if you become like a little child and say, Lord, I, I trust you, I'm dependent upon you, I receive from you your grace and your mercy and salvation. And like 2 Corinthians says, if anyone be in Christ, he can be a new creature. Old things will pass away. Behold, all things will become new. Isn't that awesome? With God, it's possible to start over. With men, he says, it's impossible, but not with God. 
For with God all things are possible. You can start over and, and find eternal life. How? Go. Leave behind those things you know you need to leave behind, those things that you have trusted in or put before God. This man trusted in riches, Jesus said. And then he says, follow me. Some leave sad. I can't give up my old life. I can't give up my immorality. I, I can't give up my alcoholism. I, I can't give up my drugs. I, I can't give up my money and, and, and trusting and making that the center of my life. Uh, unwilling to leave the old and leave behind things that buy us off so cheap. Jesus says, go. Leave the old life. Come. Follow me. And it's a lifelong process, as I said earlier, this going and coming, still trying to be childlike, still trying to trust, still trying to be dependent, still trying to believe, still trying to receive all that he has. See, I, I want you to listen. I want you to pay attention. We're, we're almost done. Whatever your past is like, I don't know the hurts that you've experienced in life. We've all got them. I, I don't know if there's been abuse or abandonment in your life. Loneliness, feelings of betrayal or emptiness. But I do know this, that Jesus wants to give you a new heart. That's what he does. And he says, if you will go and leave that behind and trust and believe and depend you can receive a loving Savior who never leave you or forsake you, and he can awaken within you and give you a heart that you never had before. Listen to the last section of this passage. Peter spoke up. Lord, we, we've left all to follow you. And Jesus said, I, I, I say to you, there, there's no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers, children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Jesus, come, follow me. And he says, you have no idea what I have for you. And you have no idea what heaven will be like and the age to come and eternal life. I'll never forget as, as the Lord first began to knock on the door of my heart as a young person, I, I saw a little bumper sticker on someone's car out at the beach. I, I was walking by it and it said, one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. I thought, what? What does that mean? It means that's what really matters in life. And life goes by pretty quick. You know, my, my wife and I now at this stage in our life are older and we have grandkids and we look at each other and go, how did this happen to us? How did we get here? I don't know. We were just young kids the other day. Now look at us. We go to bed at nine o'clock. But part of our goal as followers of Christ is not only to, to leave to go and leave those things behind, but also to follow him and to help others also find him, right? That's what these guys did. So we left everything, and, and they did. They left everything. In fact, they gave everything to follow him. Most of them, their very lives. In fact, all of them. Shall we not receive a hundredfold now at this time and in the age to come eternal life. That's the thing you don't want to miss. You don't want to miss e eternal life while you're pursuing all this other stuff. Not, not only just, just heaven, but the life that God has for you here and now on this earth. 
It's not just about getting your fire insurance, as someone said, but it's a quality of life. It's a relationship with the Lord. It's being able to, to step into life and, and, and recognize that there's a relationship to be had with the Lord that is real and rich and alive. It comes with this little simple phrase sometimes in the noisy world that we live in, where, where God would say to you and me, be still for a minute and know that I'm God. Would you slow down and just listen to me and look around the world at what people are doing and what they're chasing? Would you just be still for a minute and, and know that I'm God? This is kind of the story of that rich man. He had it all going on. I'm young. I'm rich. I've got it all going on. I've got everything. But he sees Jesus and he hears Jesus holding a little baby and he sees something there that he's not had. And he comes and he falls before him. He goes, what can I do to get this life? And he said, well, there's, there's something you're trusting in that's never going to give it to you. If you'll leave that behind and come and follow me, then, then you'll have it. He went away sad. And I would submit to you that a lot of people who have everything, if you dig a little deep, there's a sense of sadness in their life without Christ. Because he's the only one who gives life. Jesus said it himself, I, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. And he offers it to us freely. And he says the only way you can get it, however, is to become like a little child. You got to trust. You got to be dependent. And you got to receive. So if you're here today and you've never ever accepted or received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or if you're a prodigal who drifted far away from him, God's trying to get your attention. You say, how do you know that? I just know. That's who he is. Jesus says, the Bible speaking his words, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone would open, I would come in. I, I like to say this, and, and we'll close and we'll take communion. God has done everything he needs to do to have a relationship with you. Amen. You are not waiting on the Lord. He's waiting on you. Amen. And that's true in all our lives, Christian and non-Christian. He's waiting on you. If you don't know him, he's waiting on you to open the door of your heart. If you're a prodigal, He's waiting on you to come back. You know, I love the story of the prodigal son who's there in the pig pen and he's making up all these things he's going to say to his dad. I'm going to tell him this. I'll just be a hired servant. I'm not fit to be your son. Just let me work out in the field. And the whole time, the father's watching and wait, he's waiting. If he had known that the father had a gold ring, a pair of sandals, a fatted calf to kill, and a party to throw, the moment he came over that hill, he might have come home a lot earlier, right? He didn't know that. He thought dad was going to be mean and cruel and make him do all this stuff, become a heart. No, he said, my son, my daughter, if you will, once was dead, but now he's alive. And that's the wonderful refrain of heaven. When a child comes home to him, he goes, oh, my son, my daughter, they were dead. Now they were alive. And it says, all heaven rejoices when just one sinner comes home. Amen. Isn't that great? Amen. 